how to minister to unchurched teenagers webinar. So we're going to be talking about how do we minister to teens who are not Christians from unchurched backgrounds themselves? Um, how do we minister to their families if they come from unchurched homes? Um, so we're going to try to cover as much around this topic as we can. This is a topic, a question we get a lot with Rooted. Um, and quite frankly, a lot of us are when we get asked this question, we're left wondering like, yeah, that's a great question. We should think more about that. So this is our attempt to try to think more about it. Um, but I think it, what you guys saw on the webinar, this is not just like a us talking to you guys, but it's also a brainstorm. We want to be able to think more about this together. Um, and so one of the things we love about Rooted is it's very much a grassroots ministry. We love the input and experience of everyone that comes to Rooted. So We'll have some time for questions at the end if anyone has any questions, but also just let you guys know we are in no way the final authority on this. And so if you have comments or things that you're doing, experiences that would help us or anyone else who watches this later, uh, we'd love to hear from you. So um, so at the end, we will have a time for Q&A. You can either just drop your questions or comments in the chat and we'll circle back to them, or you can do the raise your hand function on Zoom and I can unmute you and you can share uh, just as like a... Uh, legal thing to let you all know this will be posted on YouTube and we'll post it on our social media later. So um, if your voice is recorded, just know you're giving us consent to put your recorded voice up there. Um, so just be aware of that. Um, well, thanks everyone for joining. Um, we're especially, uh, I feel like especially this is a time where, you know, this topic is um, is needed more than ever because of the, the climate that we're in as a nation, uh, you know, obviously there's still so much that we're thinking about and grieving about with the events of yesterday, uh, all the shootings, the abuse scandal that's come out. And so I just think like, this is a time not to maybe shy away from topics like this, but really start engaging all the more to ask the question, as all these unchurched teens that, that we know of, or that we're connected to, we'll be asking questions. Um, what is the church doing? How do we respond? I think this is a way for us to really lean into that um, and to lovingly engage with those around us. So um, if I could just offer us, uh, start us off in a word of prayer, uh, especially in light of what, what's just going on the last week, and then we'll jump in. Our Father, we, God, we don't take lightly the call to minister to students in this, in this world, in this nation, in our lives. Lord, we, we ask that you would be merciful towards us as we, as we learn from our mistakes, Father, as we realize our errors, our complicitness in sin, our maybe even just apathy at times because of how often uh, grieving and crisis occurs. Lord, I pray that these would be moments for us to allow your spirit to work in our hearts, to lead us more to the arms of Jesus so that we can also lead teens in our areas and churches and our, our, the, the friendships that our teens have to lead them to Christ as well. Guide us in this time, God. We thank you for the chance to gather. We thank you for the technology to do so. We thank you for all those that are on this, uh, that they would in any way be blessed and encouraged, but also be able to contribute, continue to the, the mission of Rooted, to advance gospel-centered, grace-driven youth ministry but also just the mission of the gospel to reach more teens with the love of Jesus. In your son's name, amen. Well, um, some introductions are underway. Um, so I'll start off. My name is Clark. Um, I am a associate pastor in San Francisco at First Baptist Church, um, an SBC church, longstanding one of 175 years. So um, so there's a lot on, on my mind with what's gone on. Um, but I oversee the uh, youth, college, young adult, and small group ministries at my church. Um, and I've been involved with Rooted for um, about seven years now. Um, and I'm also, uh, this topic of, uh, maybe you guys can share as you introduce yourselves, this topic of, you know, why unchurched teens is so important to me. Um, I came from a non-Christian home. Um, my family's still non-Christian. So um, I came to faith when I was in middle school through the youth ministry at my church, uh, previous church. Um, and I'm also um, very much involved in missions, I'm currently getting a doctorate in a uh, doctor of missiology out of Southern Seminary. And so just um, thinking in the world of reaching people with the gospel, unchurched people. So, so I love this topic. I love that we're giving it attention. I think we need to do so more and more as time will move on. And um, and I have to apologize. I caught COVID last week, 
So thankfully, um, I cannot transmit it digitally or virtually, um, but just uh, if I cough or anything, just know it is COVID. <laughs> so I'm on the mend, thankfully. So Eric, why don't you introduce yourself to, uh, to us? Yeah, uh, my name is Eric O'Connell. Uh, I'm a uh, pastor in uh, Hillside Community Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan, but uh, I am originally a California kid. Um, I do a lot at my church. Um, I've been doing the high school youth specifically for about uh, almost 10 years now. And uh, it's interesting that I got asked to do this when I did because I'm actually still going to be involved in youth and young adult. I'm actually getting a doctorate of ministry to ministry to emerging generations. So it's definitely still a part of my passion, but I'm actually going to be focusing a lot more on outreach at my church. And a big reason is moving from California to Grand Rapids. Um, Going from unchurched to a uh, sort of like a Dutch reformed Mecca, um, people have asked me like, why do you want to get out of, uh, you know, youth and do outreach? I'm like, I long to talk to people who don't know Jesus. Um, and so it's, it's a huge longing in my heart. And so that's one reason I'm on this. But another reason is, is uh, the reason I became a Christian and then a youth pastor was because uh, I did teenage, I made teenage decisions that weren't wise. And my punishment was I had to go to youth group and learn about Jesus and become a good kid. And by the grace of God, it worked. Um, and so I was one of those unchurched teens. And uh, my youth pastor, Jesse, was instrumental in, uh, yeah, helping God uh, shelp, or shape and form who I am today and what my passions are. So very, very passionate subject for me. Awesome. Thanks, Eric. Very much the same vein as me, growing, born and raised in the heavily post-Christian city of San Francisco. So I'm right there with you. Katie, uh, introduce yourselves for us. Hey, I'm Katie Polsky. I'm from St. Louis. I have a very different background from uh, Clark and, and Eric. I, I grew up in the church. I work in the church now uh, part-time as a music director, and I also oversee the Bible studies at our church. Uh, and I also work uh, as a high school teacher and then do some writing and speaking. So um, uh I've served both on, or I should say I am serving both on the Rooted uh, Steering Committee and on the Rooted, Rooted Parents Committee, um, pursuing my uh, degree at Covenant Seminary right now as well. So kind of have my hands in a lot of different um, areas, uh, but I'm loving all of it ministry-wise. This is a passion of mine for, for the exact opposite reason. Um, growing up in the church, I we did not uh, pursue evangelism. Like I wish that we would have, um, it having unchurched friends was foreign to me. And, uh, and then the Lord sanctified me with a son <laughs> who really struggled in his faith in his teen years and had almost all non-Christian friends. And so, um, my husband and I really wrestled for several years with, um, I, you know, what does that look like as a parent? I'm representing a parent perspective here. Uh, although my husband was a former youth pastor, so we did have some experience in that. Uh, but what does it look like to love on these kids who do not know Jesus? And how can we tie that relationship um, that we build inside of our home to the church? What does that look like? Awesome. Thanks, you guys. Well, uh, so let's dive in here. Um, one of the questions that we often uh, face in youth ministry um, has to do with it's uh, this whole idea of how do we evangelize the unchurched teens and their families. Um, and it's one of the things that I think is pretty difficult for those in youth ministry and parents too. Why do you guys think there's difficulty in this subject of reaching the unchurched teens? Um, and what are some things we can do to begin approaching it or even just thinking about how to approach it as we start off? I can, I, I, I can go. Um, so I, I, for me, I think, so our, our church right now is going through um, a vision and mission process um, where we were kind of redefining it. And we read Growing Young Together and uh, amazing book. We encourage you to read it. Uh, but one of the quotes in there, um, and it, I think it really, it hits even what Katie was, what was saying in a sense, uh, time in erodes awareness of. Um, and obviously this can happen in the church and the longer time we spend in church, um, and the longer we're around non or Christians, sometimes, unless your church is very, very intentional, um, you can kind of forget. And uh, I had to preach this uh, last Sunday on Luke 18, the Pharisee and the tax collector, and how God made the tax collector righteous and the Pharisee unrighteous. And it just really shows how quickly we are as sinful humans 
to separate into us and them. And I think the longer we're in the church, the easier it is to see the unchurched as them. And almost as like uh, Haddon Robinson is a pastor who says, when we do that, we, we run the risk of turning characters, real people into characters. And uh, I think for the church, one of the th- risks we run is we forget that they're people and think that they're projects. Um, things that we have to, you know, solve and fix. And so for, for me, I, I think about, again, my own experience before being uh, churched and before being a pastor. Yeah, think back to your own conversion experience. Uh, I think that's a huge piece in all that. And and what were the things that 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 your pastors, that your church were, were doing? And when I think about it, man, so much of it was just relational um, and intentionality. Um, but I also think a huge piece of it too, and what Katie said is, um, and it depends on the context you're in, but not just asking the question, how many non-Christians are in my life at any given time? Because I think that that's a question we constantly need to be asking, but in what active ways am I seeking relationships with those non-Christians? Um, and again, seeing them first and foremost as another person, we're all equal at the foot of the cross. And so whenever we kind of take that turn into, oh, okay, well, this is a project or they're, they're not one of us, I think that's where it, it becomes really hard. So taking on the attitude of humility right from the get-go, I think is probably one of, if not the most important things. That's such a good word, Eric. Uh, I, I totally agree. I, I think I'd, uh, add um, to that, that in some sense, we've lost sight of being intentional about these relationships, finding places, finding, uh, you know, uh, relationships where we will, uh, might be uncomfortable. It's hard enough to minister to kids uh, who are youth age, who are believers, right? And so then we get so used to that, that we forget, uh, hey, I'm not I'm not fulfilling what the Lord has called me to in, in spreading the gospel beyond where I'm comfortable. And what happens when we do that is we sometimes become apathetic, even though we don't maybe admit it to the power of, of what God can do in and through our personal relationships with people. But I love what you said, Eric, that when we sit too long uh, in, in our comfortable relationships with those who are only believers, we very quickly fall into us and them that so i i think it's being intentional to find those places where we can um force ourselves to to get to know others to befriend others um to hear stories uh you know what 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 might that look like well and again also just to do life with with people you know i was it was really interesting i was at a funeral recently and one of the pastors, um, or the pastor who was doing the, the, the eulogy, he, he had remarked about, you know, the relationship he had with this man. And he said, yeah, at this wedding, he came up to me and said, I never thought I'd, I'd see the day where I'm, I'm having a drink with my pastor. And I think that is it, now personal convictions aside and whatever you choose, I mean, Jesus's first miracle was wine. And sometimes, again, that time in erodes awareness of why would you think you'd never see the day? Again, we're, we're, we're people, and these are normal things that people do as long as it's, in, it's not in excess. And so I think that's a perfect like sort of uh, cultural example of sometimes when we spend so much time, it's like, oh, here's all the unwritten rules. And I think a huge part of it, too, is realizing we've all, heard, I think we've, maybe we all haven't, but we've, a lot of us have heard the term, um, you can't expect a non-Christian to behave like a Christian. And I think that's sort of what that us versus them does. Like, oh, well, we would never. Well, we did at one point. <laughs> it's just, you know, trying to, again, connecting with, with them on a personal level. Yeah. And that's key being, finding those relationships and, and being ourself because the Lord will work in and through us. We don't need to, uh, I think sometimes we, we think too much about, okay, how, what will I say? How will I act? What will I No, Just be, be who you are in Christ mm-hmm. Look, and tells us you are a light in a dark and crooked world. That is not a switch that you have to turn on when you walk out the door. That is who you are in Christ. Be you be you and trust that, uh, you know, the relationships that you're building uh, with, with these youth, with their parents, uh, that they're seeing Christ in you just by you living (laughs) your normal life and uh, not trying to put on the show. And sorry, Clark, I want to say one one more thing just to add to what Katie just said. Exactly. And then that's what I'm saying. The, the us first them, the eroding awareness of, Think about your own personal relationships with your pastors, with your spouse, with your significant others, your friends, and think about what allowed you to 
create a level of intimacy and it was not trying to perform. It was, <laughs> here's who I am. And the people that we have the closest intimacy with are people that understand us on a level that most people don't. And so exactly feel the freedom to, to be who you are and, and around non-Christians. And I think you'll be shocked by how attractive and magnetic that is. It makes me think of, um, you know, when Tim Keller talks about, obviously he's written and talked a lot about evangelism to the unchurched society and culture that we're in. One of the things he says is evangelism is friendship, hard stop. It's not friendship evangelism where we build a friendship simply for sharing the gospel, but it's friendship where as you share your life with them, if you really are centered on the gospel, your identity is in Christ, Jesus should come up and should be shared in any facet of life. And that's something that I think my wife and I found to be true living and being on mission here in San Francisco as she's engaged with her coworkers. Um, I think one thing too, what I love what both you guys are saying, like these are the reasons why, why it's hard for us as youth ministers to engage in mission and evangelism to unchurched teens and families. One of the things I reflect on is why it's hard for us or maybe how we got here. I always love to think about that. Like what led us to this point where it is so hard? And uh, Stefan Paz is a missiologist out of Amsterdam. And one of the things he says is that we are still riding the coattails of a Christendom or post-Christendom mindset of ministry where the church was the center of social life and activity. It was the, it was the authority on morality, um, on things like marriage, society, evil, right and wrong. And we've shifted away from that, obviously, in America and in Europe, in the West, we have. Um, and yet, one of the things he says is our churches have not adjusted in how we view the church in societal life. And one of the things he calls for is now we are in a very obviously post-Christian society. I think some of us are, we see that more obviously than others. Obviously, for myself in San Francisco, we're probably one of the most post-Christian areas, probably Boston, New England as well. Uh, maybe some of the southern states are just starting to feel that, uh, but it's there. And so I think one of the things we have to ask and consider is how do we think about the, the church, the youth ministry, and our role in terms of presenting Christianity in a post-Christian culture? Um, maybe that means some of our methods and forms of church as a whole, how we structure the youth ministry, or even just how we talk about faith in the gospel need to shift. It doesn't mean we jettison everything we've inherited from post-Christendom or Christendom era, uh, we still hold on to and love, you know, our reformers, our church history. But if our faith is a missionary faith, if it was born out of Paul going to new places and adapting and contextualizing, that's a question we have to do as well. Um, and we have to ask, how do we then lead in our ministries to do that? So, man, so our next question, what are some things that we can do practically as youth pastors or as parents to create a culture of whether it's invitation, helping students to feel maybe comfortable is not the right word. Cause you know, the gospel shouldn't make us comfortable, but at least feel welcome a sense of like, yeah, I could, I could be here. Um, and maybe what are some of the things that we can do to make that shift out of a Christendom mindset into more of a, here we are in post Christendom society what can we do in our youth ministries? Because most of us are leading youth ministries and we're asking these questions. How do we reach this next generation with the gospel? Yeah, I, Clark, what you just said um, too about like the church's approach. I mean, that's preaching, preaching of the choir on that one. I, I think, you know, so, so often, you know, the, how we got here, you see the the, the, the culture we're taking place of, you know, people saying, oh, it's just narcissistic and egotistic. And they, what they have to do is just get in line. It's like, well, keep trying that approach and we'll see how long the church, uh, your church stays open. And so it's like, yeah, there might be a great ideal to, to aspire to, but the, the reality is we don't adjust our approach in some way, shape or form, but we're not going to keep, you know, they're not going to keep coming. And so, you know, when I think about that and like a way to approach it, one of the things I think is so helpful to think of and don't don't don't, don't anyone get uh, upset over this so let me explain um is almost unhitching church uh in the in the cultural understanding in the world from its institution status right and and when we're able to see church as both the body of christ and as an institution separately at times i'm not saying all the time but at times um especially to make the unchurched feel welcome 
if you're looking at the church from an institutional historical thing, don't be afraid to acknowledge where the church has failed and, and failed miserably. And part of the, you know, you have to understand the culture they're living in, even if you don't agree with it, even if you feel like, hey, churches ha have done really well in this regard. But if you know the criticisms that are levied towards the church, it helps you have an empathetic heart to say, like, you know what? Yeah, I think that, you know, issues of systemic racism could have been handled way better. I think, you know, people from the LGBTQ community, yeah, I get it. Like those, the, the, the church has not done the best job and sometimes have done some really, really horrible things in the name of, of Jesus. And for me, at least what I see when I'm able to acknowledge that they're like, okay, so you know that you're not perfect. And again, that goes back to that relational part, but not being afraid to acknowledge, acknowledge the church's institutions or the failures as an institution. Uh, don't be afraid to acknowledge scripture's a weird book. I mean, if, if you look, if, and again, uh, that, that time in erodes awareness of, I mean, Second Kings, you've got a story in which one of the prophets gets called a baldy, and then it goes in, a, a she-bear comes and mauls the youth. Like, try and explain that to anyone without using any Christianese language, and let's see how it goes. And so just acknowledge it's a weird book, and it takes a long time to try and figure out how to access its truth in a way that benefits my daily life. Um, while it still can, but to the unchurched especially. Um, and I think the biggest thing is to be able to have the confidence to say, I don't know, and let's figure it out together. Because um, there are, especially now, so many questions that I get asked regularly where I'm like, you know what? I have that exact same question too. And again, being able to create that camaraderie and that me too and that usness, I think is a, is a huge piece of, of making at least people feel welcome. And then the last thing I would say with all of that is once you're able to establish sort of that welcomeness as an unchurched person, and what worked really well for me is the directness and um, the consistency of, of my youth pastor. I'll never forget there was one scenario, and hey, we're talking about unchurched, so I'll just be very, uh, very vulnerable. I had stolen um, some money and some drugs from my neighbor's house, and uh, I got in a lot of trouble, and he had found out, and I didn't want the cops called on me, so I called my youth pastor instead, and as he got to my house, I said to him, hey, man, hey, Jesse, if you could just tell him that we've been doing counseling for a little bit, like, that way he won't call the cops on me. Um, he didn't actually address my question, but I got back in the car, and I'll never, I, I could paint the scene for you. He said, just so we're clear, I'm glad to help. If you ever ask me to lie for you on your behalf, again, our relationship will be over. That's a line I'm not willing to cross. And for me, who is searching for some sort of moral compass, knowing he cared about me, and this, there's been a lot of work that had been done before, but knowing he really cared about me and then actually taking the time to show up, I actually had to, I actually cared about the truth he was trying to present to me at that point. It actually meant something to me. And there was relational equity built, but all of it started with him saying, hey man, who are you and how do I get to know you? Um, and I think sometimes you like to put the cart before the horse. Don't, don't do this, don't do that. No, you know what? Be okay in the messiness. And then as the messiness starts to get a little bit cleaner, it's okay to start communicating some truth. But I think that's that's an A to Z jump, maybe not an A to B. Yeah. And then I love how you mentioned those things. Um, some of you on here, you may be familiar with the uh, How to Reach the West Again podcast that Tim Keller and Savia City host. One of the things that they emphasize a lot in that podcast as they interview church leaders and pastors around the world is this idea of uh, belonging before believing. Um, and when I heard them talking about that, I was saying that's youth ministry. Like we kids always belong to the community before they believe whether they're grew up in the church or not. Um, and so that's very much something we can do in our youth ministries. And something I've found, you know, my previous youth ministry, we found that about 54% of our youth were coming from unchurched backgrounds um, just coming from the neighborhood in the city. And a large reason was because it was a place of belonging. It was a place, it was, we were one of the only churches, if not the only church in the neighborhood that had a youth ministry. And so it was a place where kids could gather without having to worry about getting in trouble, drugs or alcohol, um, you know, being in promiscuous situations, and they could just belong with their friends. But that also meant we had to shift a little bit in how we viewed our language, what we do. And so we, I, I made this realization about two or three years in, I couldn't assume anything uh, about biblical knowledge and literacy. Um, you know, sometimes pastors, we have this tendency when we're preaching to say like, oh, you remember when Moses did this in Exodus? Well, if they're on church, they have no idea. 
And so instead of saying, hey, remember and assume, we paint the picture for them. Um, we don't assume every kid comes with a Bible and say, open your Bibles, but rather we're going to look at a passage today. And so even just our language that can convey some belonging um, before the kids even believe can help with that. And I think we can do it in ways that are not, you know, the previous, again, if we're thinking about this whole Christendom or post-Christendom versus post-Christian era, a lot of the evangelism methods of reaching unchurched teens in this post-Christendom or Christendom era were very attractional. It was come to the church, see how awesome we are. Let's put on big events to draw the kids and they'll just naturally want to believe and belong. Well, that's not the case anymore. And so not to say that that even worked before, but that definitely won't work now. And so we still need to center and root ourselves on the gospel, on biblical teaching, not shying away from hard doctrines, but we can do it in a way that allows students to belong uh, and feel a sense of this is a space for me to learn about this too, because it's not just a space for Christians. Dark Tim, Tim Keller has a video series. Uh, you mentioned the title. I can't, I, I can't remember what the title is, but how to reach the West again. I, I, I guess how to, that's, <laughs> that's it. Um, I encourage everyone to listen to that, uh, but it just reinforces exactly what Clark is saying, that we need to be educated in the narratives uh, of our youth right now. What 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 are the narratives that they're being fed, right? So identity is a huge one, um, freedom, happiness, the morality narrative, you know, all those things so that our teaching has that in mind. Um, so both shying away from, I, I guess, over explaining, that's part of it, but also having in mind um, how they will filter what we're saying. Uh, they are being catechized right now um, in, in these different ways. We've got to be educated in that in order to understand both how to teach it and apply, knowing how they're hearing it. Um, that's just, that's so key. Uh, and I loved what you said, Eric, too, just about um, creating a culture uh, where questions are good. Uh, I think that's huge. It's really important that unbelieving friends see that we have questions too. So when we have, a, you know, ask the pastor night or whatever, write down your questions and we're just going to talk uh, through questions uh, one night. It's for everybody, right? It's not just for, so that, yes, bring your unbelieving friends, but how important and significant is it for them to see we don't have it all figured out either. Uh, even your pastor has has questions. Um, your leaders have have questions. So for them to see that is as significant as their questions uh, that they bring to the table. And, and I'm about to give uh, another piece of advice that uh, might sound very, very Sunday schoolish, which uh, given the topic is very ironic. But um, if you want to, you know, try and figure out some tips and recommendations, honestly, go read the gospel accounts of how Jesus interacted with his disciples. And I mean, and I mean disciples intentionally, because we like to put them up on a pedestal as if they are heroes. I mean, you read Jesus's interactions with the disciples, it is not all right, you get it, you understand it, you're on the right path. It's 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 struggle it's it's work it's toil it's labor just to be able to 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 get them to understand a parable and so you know there's yeah we're, we're all we're all broken in that regard and then to the other thing of being able to actually understand um culture and the culture they live in just a huge uh shout out i know that for a lot of people you go what the first question is where do i even go to learn some of that stuff because it's not like you're just going to go spend hours on youtube cpyu.org walt mueller center for parent and youth understanding literally does this work for you if you're a youth pastor. It literally um, interprets and sort of exegetes culture and puts it out in really helpful Christian worldview things. I could not recommend that site enough. Awesome. We'll, uh, we'll make sure any resources that are mentioned here are uh, posted in show notes and on the blog later. Um, this kind of leads us to maybe one more question that we have some time to talk about. And it's in regards to as our as these unchurched kids, if they come to the church and start belonging, even before they believe, and let's say they do come to believe even, um, one of the biggest questions we get at Rooted, one of our five pillars is partnering with parents. How do you do that with parents, either parents of non-believing children, or more frequently the question is non-believing parents of children who are in our youth ministries? That's something I face, again, majority of our, our kids in my old youth ministry were from unchurched backgrounds, which meant probably even more than that, 60, 70% of their parents were not Christian. Um, 
how do we partner with them? What does partnership look like? Because it's obviously not going to be for discipleship. And yet we also want to acknowledge the youth ministry should never be an isolated siloed ministry. Um, we want to work with parents. We want to be on the same team, even if we have different goals. What does that look like? And uh, maybe, you know, even Katie, you can tell us from the parent side, as you've dealt with some of the friends uh, of your kids and their families. I, I think it's significant. This is where the us versus them that you mentioned, Eric, comes in. Um, it's significant to uh, acknowledge so much of the commonality, first of all, as much as uh, any anyone would want to be communicated with, whether they're Christian or not, we, we need to make sure that uh, they're involved in uh, in our, our youth ministries, uh, in our, in our lives, I'm speaking from a parent's perspective, um, just knowing some of the, the parents, um, who my teens are friends with, uh, it starts with a relationship and that relationship means communication, connectedness, um, service, service is a huge thing. Um, uh, speaking, especially, uh, in regard to, to youth ministry, how can we serve you as parents that speaks volumes? Um, so, uh, I, th I, but I think starting with, with, uh, friendship relationship, finding, um, commonality, um, that's crucial. Yeah. Um, it, I, 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 amen to all that. And again, I'm speaking from, uh, I think, I think primarily from, a, um, again, my experience as an unchurched and both of my, both of my parents not being churched at all, um, serve them, uh, serve them in explicit ways, serve them in, uh, you know, ways that maybe they don't even know, but just it, it, put yourself in their life as much as possible. And I know for, for my parents, one of the things that just made the world of a difference was not just affirming me as a, as a student, you know, saying nice things, especially a lot of unchurched parents, they're just, they just want their, they just want to know that their kid isn't destroying anything, right? A lot of the time that they're just not, they're not absolutely going and making a muck in the world. So just being able to say, it's such a good kid. Like, man, I really love having their presence. I love having them being around. That means a lot. Um, and also when you get the opportunity, find something to affirm even in that parent, you know, um, and, and be relentless about trying to actually, again, continue to create relationship. Um, my dad passed away when he was 44, my uh, freshman year of college. And I'm so thankful to my youth pastor, because one of the things that he did and actually really helped me is, you know, my dad and I didn't have a great relationship. We were always button heads. But, um, you know, I'll, I'll never forget, he did, my pastor did like some, this uh, mediation between me, my dad and my mom one time. And uh, I was convinced going into that, that my dad was the bad guy, um, that he was wrong and he was, there's was no uh, redemption there for him. And afterwards, my youth pastor just sat down and he goes, you know, your dad drove 45 minutes knowing that he was about to get completely, you know, killed in that meeting from you and your mom. And he sat there and he took it because he loves you. And it was like, oh, my, like it helped me. My dad got to hear that. And it's like, there are, even if it's unchurched, there are some really amazing qualities in people that you can affirm. And when you can notice those spend time and and call it out makes the world of a difference but just don't ever stop reaching out um it, you might think it's annoying um but i'll tell you what there are so many times when uh when i think about some of the most meaningful connections i've had with unchurched people that what they'll constantly say is you never stop reaching out and that's ultimately what got me to come because the it, sometime that storm will come and at the very least you can uh, keep extending the opportunity mm. that's great um uh, you know, I was talking about this with a group of youth pastors once we were talking about this very topic, more with the teens that have walked away from the church. And one of the things that we said is, how do you reach them? It's with relentless friendship. Um, mm -hmm. Like you just, if you really care about them, you won't give up after the third or fourth or fifth time. It's relentless. Um, but I love what you said about acknowledging the good and affirming the parents. Um I think this is true of all youth ministries, but especially in my context, I've been in mostly Asian immigrant churches for, for most of my time. Not now, I'm in a multi-ethnic church. So I still work with a lot of Asian families. And so often we've seen the youth pastor as like this bridge builder between generations, cultures, uh, helping with different political beliefs, family strife, like that's really our role in a lot of ways. If we want to see our ministry as holistic to the whole family, not just the team, we can be bridge builders. Um, that requires a lot of work. There's a lot of nuance to navigate as we work with two different generations, but there's a lot of beauty there that can happen with reconciliation. 
And it also makes me think about, especially, you know, in our time and age where all these stories, like the whole abuse scandal that came out with SBC report, um, other instances coming out across the board with churches. I think one of the things that unchurched parents or non-Christian parents want to know the most if their kid is attending our youth group is, is this going to be a safe place? Um, are you going to handle my child with respect and dignity? And so this is where I found that this is where we can really be above reproach. We can show our integrity as leaders and do everything we can to put the parents at ease. Um, and so I've just made it one of my commitments. I want to over communicate the best I can to parents when it comes to uh, events or outings or anything that we do, just that we're, we're in, we ensure the not just the safety, but the, the thriving of the child in all the ways that we deem thriving, which is physical safety, which includes, you know, emotional safety, but also we include in that spiritual thriving in the gospel. And that should trickle to all those other things. Um, and we also just want to be above reproach in our interactions with the students, making sure as much as we want deep discipleship, which often means one-on-one, -on -one, but we're going to do our best to be above reproach with same gender in public spaces uh, with multiple adults around, multiple kids around, just so we can ensure that we really sh we show the parents we really care uh, about these kids, not just about them becoming Christians, uh, but their holistic life path and life growth. To that point, Clark, um, one thing that I, I think, and uh, you just totally reminded me of it, what I think is so important, and I think what something Katie said earlier, understanding the culture, one of the best things you can do is understand the criticisms and the narratives that are in the mainstream of the world. Because when we work for a church, I think most pastors would be surprised by how many unchurched think that the Catholic church and we are the exact same thing. And so they'll, the, those lines between the, the, the abuse that the church has, you know, put on people and the Catholic church sometimes get very much mixed. You see, um, you know, versions of TV shows where, where Christian leaders are painted as cult leaders. And so, um, I know it sounds weird to say in this context, but as much consent that you can get from the parents to let them know, I am not trying to brainwash your child. We would never think that, but there's certainly, go there's going to be that fear and anxiety. I'm not trying to take your child away from your family. I'm trying to just spend time with them. I'm not trying to brainwash them. I'm not trying to make them think this way or that way, but even having some language to be able to have a point of reference and a mutuality with that parent, man, it makes a huge difference. It's great. Thanks, you guys. Well, um, it's about that time for us to move into some questions or comments. So again, if anyone, any of you guys attending, you want to chime in and speak up, say like, this is what it looks like in my church. There's some questions I'm wrestling with. We'd love to have you speak or drop it in the chat. We have one question uh, that was put in there during uh, our conversation about creating a culture. And this is a great question. Yeah. Um, how do we practically create that sense of belonging without sacrificing the marks of Christian gathering? Uh, one of the examples is worship songs. Do we sing some that unbelievers will be familiar with um, or ones that will just make them feel awkward because they're not familiar? Um, should we create different lanes, um, lanes of discipleship, so to speak? So what are you guys thoughts on that? How do we hold on to Christian distinctiveness while also inviting belonging? You can go first, Katie. I can talk, but you can go first if you like. Yeah, I, I, um, my initial thought is that uh, we need to be careful uh, to not bend too much to what we would typically do. So let me just first talk in a large uh, corporate setting, like in our in our church services. Um, we should assume every Sunday that there are unbelievers there. That doesn't mean that we, I you know, I'm I'm a music director. I I. I pick certain songs to aid God's people in worship, um, but always thinking in, uh, in my head, whether it's the liturgy or, or the theology of the music, that there will be unbelievers present. Within that, we do practical things to make unbelievers feel as welcome as possible. So a liturgy will be explained, right? Um, when the benediction and people hold up their hands, it's often said, here's what, so that it, they're not looking around going, what's, wait, what's happening right now, right? We do as much as we can to make them feel welcome, but we don't uh, bend too much to what we would typically do. So now let's apply that in a youth ministry um, setting. I, I, I think I, I'd say the same, maybe uh, on some weeks you could tweak and all that. Um, 
Eric and Clark speak more specifically into that, but I'd say you do what you typically do and trust in the power of God to work uh, through that. Um, they're coming for all different reasons. Uh, so we need to be aware, right, that they're unbelievers there. So over like what we've said, uh, you know, speaking through um, and explaining as much as as we can, making the gospel clear and relevant, knowing the cultural narratives that should all apply to what we're doing. But I don't think we need to be uh, to to overthink. What do I need to change or shift uh, knowing that there's an unbeliever coming tonight? You do what you do and trust, trust the Lord. Amen. And I, I think, um, so I'm going to reference one book. This is a book called Strange Rights, um, just written not, uh, not too long ago by Tara Burton. Amazing book. Um, really, the whole thesis of it is that we, we actually don't live in a godless world. We live in a spiritual uh, but not religious world. Right. And so that actually makes up uh, a really huge amount of our population. The amount of actual atheists, actual atheists um, are, are pretty low in, in number. Um, a lot of people are mixing and matching a lot of spiritualities. And um, so but what she what she communicates is that and it, uh, has a very convincing argument that what young people are looking for um, and we're seeing it happen in real time is, are four things, meaning, purpose, community and ritual. And you can, if any major fad, any major community, you're going to find those four things. Well, what, who does those four things better than, than the church? I mean, that, that, that's what we're built on, meaning, purpose, community, and ritual. And so um, exactly what Katie just said, if we're using that us versus them language, um, an interesting way of looking at it, um, remember that you're, minister, you're still ministering to both of them. We are the church. We are the body of Christ. And so there is an exclusivity. There are very gracious requirements, but still requirements to be a part of the body of Christ, right? And so recognizing that we might have those two categories and also recognizing that the us in the room might not actually know what the content of the song is trying to teach, that they might be just as lost a, a, as them. And so see it as a great, um, if you take that meaning, purpose, community, and ritual, like if we use the the worship thing as a as a, a specific example, if you're gonna sing a song, um, "Good Good Father" or whatever song that you're gonna uh, come thou fount, before you actually start, take some time. What's the meaning of the song? You know, hey, uh, we're about to sing a song together, and I know that some of you guys may not know it, but man, this is this is really what we're saying. Um, this is the purpose that it gives us in our life as a community. We celebrate it, but guess what? We also recognize that this community is made up of church believers, and so one of the things we do as a ritual is we sing together. If you're uncomfortable with that, we totally get it. Um, but at the couching the the language that you would use anyway in a very um, warm, inviting way, I think, because I just always remember in high school, we, we would do communion in youth group, and I'll never forget, I brought a friend one time, and uh, my youth pastor, Jesse, at the time, he goes, all right, now it's time to drink the body and the blood of Christ, and that friend looked at me and was like, where in the world did you bring me? But if you take the time to say, no, this this is what this is for us. This is this is the meaning it has for us. It's the purpose it gives us, and we do it together in community, and this is how we express it. I think you'd be shocked by how many young people would actually go, oh, okay, that makes a lot more sense to me. You're just singing silly songs. That's one thing. But if, if, if this is rooted in some sort of meaning and purpose that's outside of myself, that's really attractive to young people. So don't, don't apologize for the meaning, purpose, community, and ritual that you have in your church. That's actually more attractive than you think. That's a good word. That's great. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Um... You know, it makes me think about too. I think I think it might have been Julius Kim that was talking about this. Like, even though we have kids that grew up in the church, we always want to view them as they're on the road of discipleship, and they may not have arrived, even if they've been in the church eighteen years. Um, and so, this is something I constantly have to remind myself of. I can't again. I, we've said this already. We can't assume anything. So we can treat, especially in youth ministry, all these kids are still learning. They're still growing. They're still wrestling with faith and doubts and what does this mean? And so the more we can communicate and not just assume with Christianese language, but really drill down and ask, what does this actually mean? When we say these words, what does that actually mean? Um, it's one of the things I love about youth ministry. You can't hide behind Christianese terms or big theological terms. You have to explain everything. Um, and I think the more we do that, the more we serve 
both the unchurched kids, but also our own kids that are there week to week. So great question. Thanks for sending that in. Anyone else has any, any questions or just comments? If you want to share with us how you're wrestling with and approaching this uh, topic, we'd love to hear from you. You can raise your hand, type it in the chat. I can unmute you. Um, yeah, I think, you know, uh, I think, yeah, and it really all depends on where you're at um, in terms of like geographically, but, you know, for being in Grand Rapids, and if you come, if you're in a, in a space that can be sort of conservative, um, largely conservative, and or um, just, you know, sort of a Bible belt, um, recognize that, and I, I can't, that, man, it bums me out, again, being an unchurched kid, but um, recognize that the when you do this work, and if you're intentional about it, first and foremost, recognize that to do this work effectively means that you have to be in their lives, which is going to take a, a decision in the first place mm -hmm. um, to be very intentional about it. But um, ever since I became a Christian, any church that I've ever heard do this well, reach unchurched teenagers, inevitably, there's going to be the rub that comes from church leadership of, well, we want them here, but but let's make sure we, we're really careful and, you know, don't ruin the facility, don't do this. And there's a way of sort of, again, outing them even in, in leadership that and even when you start from that spot, I mean, it, it will trickle down. And, and so just being radically just recognizing, you know what, this is as much as this is our space, our ministry, this is what God is, has, has, uh, charged us to steward well so you know what if if they get some some if they ruin some of the picture frames on the wall if there's a hole in the wall guess what god's got a a, a, a much bigger budget than we do and, and abilities and and also recognize that i think you're gonna have to wade into really uncomfortable topics that you may think the church doesn't have any um, place in, but if you actually want to be a part of their lives, you're going to have to enter into things like Black Lives Matter, LGBT issues, uh, gun reform with this. I mean, those are, I even just saying it out loud, I, I cringe a little bit because I'm like, oh gosh, who might be listening to this? But that's their world. And, yeah. and, and you, you're you going to have to get into it if you actually want to have any say or change in it. Right. That's scary. Good word. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I think creating an environment with your kids who are consistent, who do know the Lord, um, you know, that not only showing them what it looks like to engage in those kind of hot topics with unbelievers, that's important. Uh, but it's also important to acknowledge, uh, and be honest with your own insecurities and then offer that be, there should be a sense in which, uh, we as leaders and with our kids are always praying about this. Um, Lord, who, with the anticipation, who are you going to bring into our lives um, and help us to trust that when that happens, uh, that you're going to, you're going to work, uh, you know, help us. I'm studying first, second and third John right now, just help us to, uh, to love each other. Well, so there's a lot of teaching, I think that goes on, um, with our own uh, kids in the church to say, here's what it looks like to welcome in un unbelievers. Um, here's how we engage in these topics. And um, also, I know it's not easy. It's not easy for me either. Um, that needs to be a constant dialogue so that, um, you know, it's, it's a natural, it's a natural process. It's a natural thing when, um, when the Lord, uh, you know, brings people to us who don't know him. Mm. That's great. There's a, there's a great question that came in. Um, it says there's a, there's an assumption we're talking about unchurched teens who've come through the door. How about teens that haven't come through the door? And um, I'll kind of just share my thoughts as I share my closing thoughts. If you guys want to jump in with that too late after you can, but um there's there's some thoughts in um, biblical missiology, I can just use those terms, where uh, there's a question of, is the church today meant to be a uh, come and see or go and be force? Um, or, or what a lot of Old and New Testament theologians will say, is it a centrifugal, like drawing into the center or centripetal, sending out? Um, Israel seemed to be more of a centrifugal where the nations are drawn to the center of Israel. The church is seen as more of a centripetal. The disciples are sent out to the nations, but I think really it's a, it's a false dichotomy. It's meant to be a both and right. Like we are called to go, 
but we're also then called to draw them back. And it's this, you know, it's a cycle. Um, and so I think for that reason too, we can even view our youth ministries in the sense of there's going to be a lot of kids coming in. So much of youth ministry is the kids that are already there that have been drawn uh, to the doors. How do we draw them further, deeper into relationship with Christ? But I think part of youth ministry can also be asking if we want, if we're creating whole disciples, how do we then send them out? Um, and that doesn't start when they go to college or when they go on a short-term mission trip. It starts as soon as they enter life with Christ. Um, and that's something I think that I also had to make a shift in partway in my youth ministry was realizing like, as much as yes, a lot of these kids are on the path of discipleship, they maybe still haven't gotten it. A lot of them have, and a lot of them have chosen to embrace Christ, especially where I was in San Francisco to make a decision to follow Jesus, um, meant you were all in, um, it means you're all in here. And so I had to realize I, I can't take that lightly and I need a steward well and really applaud these kids and learn how do we then equip them to be sent out. Um, and so we can even see our, our own missional force in the youth ministry is equipping the students themselves to go and make disciples. Something we always say we want every church member to do, and yet we often forget to do with the students. Um, but often I think they're the best ones because they're already in relationship with non-Christians every day. They're at a common space where they're sharing about ideologies, religion, sociology in the school system and education. Um, and you know, a, a lot of a lot of people when we talk about as youth ministers, how do we be on mission? Well, we think about like, are we going to schools? Are we meeting kids in the dining hall or in the commons? Well, where I'm in San Francisco, I can't do that. Um, adults aren't allowed on campus. Uh, and even if they were, it would probably be frowned upon to see a 34 year old man come in and try to have lunch with a 17 year old on campus. Um, and this is where I think we can really equip and empower the kids to do that, to help them to see like, what is your role in the mission of God? As you embrace Jesus, as Jesus embraced you in the gospel, how do you then bring that and steward that to others? Um, and so there's some things that we can do to program and shift our thoughts with, um, leading our kids to do that. Um, so what we did was we created a student leadership where we entered in deeper discipleship, told these kids, this is going to be for your formation. A lot of it is going to be for your own disciple making, um, at your schools. And I would give them assignments to go to their schools and lead a Bible study, talk with friends. And we would just share with each other. It was like simple, very simple, but it was similar to what we would do for like short-term missions, training and debrief, but we were doing it on a monthly basis, uh, to their schools. So I think there's small ways we can think about that um and equip and empower the kids to do that as well so i don't know if you guys have any closing thoughts too as we we end up this time that's great i um the that for just as a side note that centrifuge and centrifuge that it just uh struck me that that that's like a heartbeat of the church right just mm -hmm. constantly in and out so like that's just a really cool picture so thanks for sharing that um yeah, I, I think with that one too, um, and as much as I totally agree with you, Clark, um, trying to find even creative ways to be in appropriate spaces in schools, you know, um, uh, like for me, there's a, there's a FCA, Fellowship of Christian Athletes. Um, I'm hoping to become a character coach for the football team. It's like, yeah. it's, it's a really specific way. Um, you know, they'll go to football games and, or one of the best things is to even just, if you have a good relationship with a student, have lunch with them outside of the school, their, their friends will notice. So yeah, don't be the creepy person going up, but try and find creative ways to, you know, introduce yourself and insert yourself into their lives. Um, nonprofits, if there's food pantries and stuff like after school programs, just ways that you can continue to serve that will give you exposure are, are always helpful. But yes, I think appropriate is, is, is hmm. the key word there. It's good. All right. Well, um, I think that's all the time we got. If you have any other questions or thoughts on this topic, um, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love for you to contribute to Rooted. We're always a growing uh, database of contributors, authors, speakers, ministry. Um, so we'd really invite you to be part of Rooted. Uh, our mission is to advance gospel-centered, grace-driven youth ministry uh, through the youth pastor and the parents. So um, we thank you for joining in. We'd, we'd love for you to continue to be part of this conversation. As we know, we probably just barely started hitting on it and there's a lot more that we could drill on deep, deep down in, especially as time goes on, as, uh, as culture shifts and change. 
Uh, but thanks everyone for joining. Um, we appreciate you all and thanks for being with us. Have a good day.